Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining Little Lunch Lectures today, April 9th. Uh, guys, we have made one year. Is our, this is our anniversary of one year of Little Lunch Lectures. So um, to all of you um, folks that have been with us a lot of times, Yay, awesome. And to those of you who might be, um, have only been a few times or maybe this is your first time, welcome, we're glad you're here. Um, just, uh, just in case for you people that are new, we are recording and we're on uh, live on Facebook, just FYI, that's a video kind of thing and you need to know that your video is out there. Um, there will be a couple of links in the chat you can check out in just a little minute. And uh, we'll keep everyone on mute until the end where you can ask a question or you can type it in the chat. So um, I'm very, very pleased today to introduce our speaker, Amy Mead. In addition to being one of the very best friends that this girl could ask for, Amy is the Area Natural Resources Agent for the North Carolina Cooperative Extension in Pender, Brunswick, and New Hanover County. So she's kind of got a, a big job. Uh, her background is in plant, coastal plant ecology and water quality. She assists residents of these counties with issues related to stormwater, erosion, and native habitat restoration. Now, another special thing about today's Little Lunch Lecture is it's officially our kickoff to the Pollinator Palooza. This is a new community education effort that we have undertaken at the Coastal Land Trust with lots of awesome partners. And it is part of the North Carolina Science Festival um, that is going around, going on statewide. This is one of their official events. Um, Pollinator Palooza is a week all about pollinators. Um, there are links in the chat for you to check out later. Um, but in a nutshell, every day this next week, we will be posting new videos on a variety of topics all related to pollinators. And that will be posted on our Facebook page. Um, and then next Friday's Little Lunch Lecture will also be about pollinators, um, birds. And so um, in the next Saturday, the 17th, we will have a live stream at 10 a.m. on our Facebook page where we will have um, educators, Amy Mead being one of them, um, zooming in from live on location from across New Hanover County to show off pollinator gardens and some other um, pollinator specific um, uh, topics and fun stuff. So um, it's gonna be nine days all about pollinators. Y'all join in, um, everything will be posted on our website later but it's way more fun to do it live. So um, y'all join us, okay? Um, so on that note, let's jump in. Amy, uh, I'm gonna send it on over to you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. So it's absolutely my pleasure to join you guys today. Like I said, I'm thrilled that it's spring. I love seeing insects in my garden. Um, and I hope you'll join me next week too. I'll be um, live from the native plant garden at the Arboretum, uh, which is just absolutely coming back to life here in the spring. Um, and I'm really passionate about native plants in our gardens uh, to support our native pollinators and our native insects and wildlife, absolutely crucial uh, in our urban habitats. Um, so today is just to kind of wet your whistle and get you excited about um, thinking about adding some of these plants to your garden. You're absolutely welcome to make fun of me because I'll say, uh, this is my favorite plant. And then I'll say the next one is my favorite plant. They're all my favorite plants. I, um, I just love uh, adding new things and trying new things in my garden. So today we're gonna talk about um, different pollinator plants that are good for coastal North Carolina. Um, like I said, I love seeing a diversity of insects in my garden. Uh, these are a couple different um, pictures that I've taken. This is actually a hoverfly. Uh, this is a wildflower. Actually, uh, Stephanie, you'll like this. This is um, from uh, Blue Clay Bike Park. It's a lot of neat wildflowers in the forest there. Um, this is one of my favorite plants. I'll talk about it a little bit later. This is uh, mountain mint. It is an absolute pollinator magnet. Um, and this is a beautiful wasp, um, a thread waste wasp. That's a hard, a hard three words to say, um, but just such a neat, gorgeous looking wasp. Hold on one second. Um, 
And then down here we have a carpenter bee, which are out in force right now. They're all out looking for mates and uh, looking for nests, but they are really important pollinators in our area. On a, a, This is one, a dusty one on a coneflower um, and lots of beautiful butterflies. I love seeing them in my garden. Here's one on an azalea. So just very quickly, I like, I like this little cartoon, uh, but it hits at the, the heart of what is a pollinator? Um, basically, a pollinator is any insect or animal that carries pollen from the male to the female parts of the flower for reproduction. And usually this happens while feeding and flying from plant to plant. Um, so this is animal mediated uh, uh, pollination. So this would be different than something like the pines, which we're seeing, that's wind pollination. So that's why we see, you know, they're putting out lots of pollen. It's a little bit lighter, so it can, it can uh, cast out on the wind. Um, but this pollen, you know, is usually heavier and needs to be moved from plant to plant. <clears throat> so when we think about pollinators, um, there are quite a diversity of pollinators. Um, there are, you know, really big, beautiful things like butterflies, moths, and skippers, and things we don't think about too much like wasps. Um, even those paper wasps that are up there that, you know, we, we don't love to see making a nest by our front door. Those are those can be pollinators, um, flies, beetles, and other insects. Um, things like hummingbirds and bats can be pollinators. Um, and then, but by and large, the powerhouse of the pollination world is going to be our bees. We tend to think of um, honeybees as, uh, you know, when we think of bees, um, and they are certainly really important for agriculture, but um, honeybees are not native bees. They are uh, European honeybees. Um, but here in North Carolina, we have over 560 species of native bees. Um, the vast majority of these are often solitary bees. They are ground nesting bees or cavity nesting bees. Um, and so these are just really important uh, for our ecosystems and for pollination. So why are they important? <clears throat> Three-fourths of our flowering plants on earth rely on this animal mediated pollination to reproduce. So these are these insects are absolutely essential for these plants to reproduce. In terms of humans, um, we need them for agriculture. A third of our world's crop production relies on pollination. Often we use honeybees to do a lot of its work. Um, and we can think of uh, you know fruit that's uh, you know, very profitable in our area in North Carolina. Blueberries is a really uh, important crop here. I apologize about the phone. Um, uh, we do use um, honeybees to pollinate those, um, but we also, they also are dependent on, okay, hopefully that will stop. <laughs> Um, but we're also dependent upon things like bumblebees. They're actually very, very effective pollinators of blueberries. There's actually bees called blueberry bees. Um, and these are actually more effective at pollinating blueberries than honeybees are. They, they take less visits to the flowers to be able to pollinate the, those crops. Um, and then pollinators and insects in general, food webs depend upon these, these insects. Um, and our, our insects or our ecosystems depend on these pollinators as well. When we think about something like birds, um, a typical chickadee is going to need to collect over 5,000 5, insects to raise one brood of, um, of baby chickadees. Um, and because those, those, um, those juvenile birds um, need higher sources of protein to be able to raise those broods. So even seed, seed eating birds are gonna need more insects. Um, as they're raising their broods. So when we think about a typical American yard, um, you know, especially new construction, we see a lot of things like this. Um, you know, all of the nat native vegetation has been removed. Um, it's been replaced by, you know, turf. We have got these lovely cube-shaped uh, shrubs here. We've got a little monkey grass, um, but there's very, very little for um, wildlife here very little for insects, for birds. Um, so essentially, you know, this is a somewhat of a food desert for, uh, for insects and for wildlife. So we can kind of turn this aesthetic on its ear. It's very tidy, you know, this is kind of a tidy aesthetic, but we can turn it on its ear here, same house. And you can see that they have um, probably pissed off their neighbors and, uh, you know, changed the whole yard. 
and created an incredible diversity of, um, of flowers, of shrubs, add some trees in here. Um, and so, you know, this is a great landscape um, that's gonna provide a lot of um, pollen sources and nectar um, and uh, host plants for, for different insects. Um, you don't have to do this to your yard though. You know, so I, I definitely don't think you need to go home and rip everything out that's not native. But what you can do is you can add native plants to your yard and add these sources of pollen and nectar for, uh, to support pollinators and wildlife in your yard. So we don't think about trees as being great, you know, pollinator uh, supporting plants, but they're absolutely essential for pollinators. Um, something like the Eastern redbud, is, which is a native tree and a great tree for our area, is going to be one of the earliest blooming trees. So as, as these insects are coming out of hibernation, you know, uh, they're waking up, uh, this is, they're gonna be looking for these early sources of nectar. And so red buds are blooming. We just, uh, we probably just reached, uh, you know, went over the peak of those red buds blooming, but such a lovely tree for our area. Uh, so, you know, if somebody's thinking about planting a crepe myrtle, this might be a better alternative, uh, a native alternative to that. Here's a beautiful cultivar called Rising Sun. What I like about this uh, is that as the leaves emerge, they have these beautiful heart-shaped leaves. As the leaves emerge, um, the first ones will be a beautiful apricot, orangey color, and, then, and as they, as they um, mature, they'll turn a yellow, golden color, and then chartreuse, and then eventually they'll all turn a darker green, but they have this beautiful ombre effect as the leaves come out in the spring. So it's such a lovely tree for our area. Ah, got it now. So this is a leaf cutter bee. So if you do have a red bud in your yard, you might have seen um, seen these little half moon shaped cutouts um, in the leaves. And this is the work of a leaf cutter bee. So this is one of our native bees. Um, this is a solitary cavity nesting bee. And so what the female bee will do is um, she will uh, create this cavity, usually in dead wood, um, and she will line it with little cutouts from uh, red buds. Sometimes you also see these cutouts out if you have petunias in, in, in flower pots and things like that. They, they do like petunia leaves as, or uh, petunia flowers as well. But she'll line her cavity um, and then she'll actually put a little parcel of pollen in there along with an egg and then she'll, she'll seal up the cavity and she'll create these little cavities with eggs and pollen. And then the larva will feed on the pollen. And then eventually they will, uh, they will um, you know, emerge and they'll all go on their way. So um, she never meets her offspring. She, she does all of her work and lays her eggs and then, um, and then leaves, leaves the nest. So as I mentioned, trees are incredibly important for pollinators um, and many, many species of moths and butterflies depend on specific trees uh, as their host plants. A good example um, of a, a beautiful and a very uh, you know, iconic butterfly for our area is the Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. Um, here are a couple of uh, the different trees that uh, this uh, uses as a host plant for its caterpillars. Um, tulip poplar is one. Uh, Carolina cherry laurel is, uh, that's actually uh, just finishing its bloom right now as well. You can see a lot of those in hedgerows. Carolina cherry laurels um, have great fruits on them that the birds really love. And so you'll see them, uh, you know, the birds eat those and then they'll go, you know, sit in another tree. So you often see Carolina cherry laurels growing up, um, you know, in and amongst other trees. But it's a wonderful early blooming tree for our area. And it is a host plant for the eastern tiger swallowtail. Sweet Bay Magnolia is another lovely tree for our area. Again, a host plant for the tiger swallowtail. Um, and, and all of these have blooms on them um, that, are, you know, that are gonna be great for pollinators as well. And these are all wonderful for wildlife. So take, you know, when we talk about structure, we wanna talk about, you know, we have the tree canopy and then we have that shrub layer and then we have our ground cover and perennial. So, you know, a couple of plants that are good for that shrub layer. This is one of my favorite shrubs for pollinators. It's sweet pepper bush or clethora. Um, this is a deciduous shrub. Um, in general, it's gonna be about five to 10 feet tall, blooms in July and August. Um, it can be great as a screen, so you can plant uh, many of them together. Or you can have it as a specimen or border. 
Um, really attractive to pollinators. It's got these great panicles of white flowers on it. And then followed by fruits. There are a couple of different cultivars that are more dwarf cultivars. One is Ruby Spice, which has some uh, pink flowers to it. Um, and then another that's uh, quite popular is 16 Candles, which is another lovely cultivar, a little bit smaller. A couple of other shrubs that I really like for the landscape. Um, uh, this is inkberry. So it, you know, if you have a place where you're maybe replacing boxwoods and you want an evergreen shrub, this is a nice native shrub for our area. Really hardy, uh, hardy for our area. Um, does have a little kind of smaller inconspicuous flowers and then followed by berries. There is a, a dwarf variety called sh shamrock, which will be a little bit smaller. I do love beautyberry. Um, this, uh, this is a neat plant. It is deciduous, so it will lose its leaves in the fall uh, or in the winter. Um, but what's neat about it is it does have the flowers are, are somewhat inconspicuous, very small flowers that grow right off the stem in little clusters around the stem. And then in the fall, you'll see these beautiful, absolutely vividly purple berries. So this is a nice feature uh, for your garden in the fall to see these lovely purple color. Um, and then the fruits are, are, are quite attractive to songbirds as well. So now moving down to that next layer, that ground layer of perennials. And this is, I will say, my favorite plant. Uh, and mountain mint is just an absolute magnet for pollinators in your garden. Every year I try to get a picture with as many pollinators in one picture as possible, and I fail every time. Um, but you can see in this picture, we've got a carpenter bee, um, here's a, a wasp right here. Um, here's one of these beautiful metallic green sweat bees. There's another uh, another one right here. Um, but you know this this plant to me draws the greatest diversity and number of pollinators to my garden. Um, it's going to be about two to three feet tall. Uh, the flowers are you know it has little florets here in the middle, a uh, little uh, white you know somewhat inconspicuous little flower. But then it's uh, surrounded by these lovely silvery white downy leaves um, beneath the flowers. So it's got a really nice look to it. Um, it can spread aggressively, so it does spread by runner. Um, so you really wanna make sure you plant it in a place where you don't mind it running or, or, or it's bound by something. Um, but because of that nature, it can help with erosion um, and it is quite drought tolerant. So this to me is a really hardy plant for the garden and I, I really enjoy it. Uh, the good news about it spreading aggressively is it's easy to pull up. So it's not going to be something like IV that's going to be impossible to tear up. So it does, it does pull up quite easily and then you can give it to your neighbor. Uh, last year, this was my favorite uh, pollinator plant in the whole, uh, at the Arboretum, spotted horse mint. Sometimes it's called spotted bee balm. Um, it's just such an interesting looking uh, plant, two to four feet tall. It's an herbaceous perennial, so it's going to die back to the ground at the end of the year. It is quite drought tolerant um, and it, uh, people do use it as a cut flower so it's good because it's got such an interesting color and shape and texture. Um, it can be deer and rabbit resistant so that if that's a problem in your area this might be a good pollinator plant for you. Um, what's neat about it is the flower is so unusual. It has these uh, little, yeah this is the flower, it's actually a yellow flower um, with these little spots on it. It almost is reminiscent to me of an orchid flower. And then it's got these um, these purple bracts around that are, that are in whorls around the stem, and and there are little stacks of them like this. Um, you can see the mechanism of that of the way that it moves pollen. You can see the uh, this bee going in here, and then it, the pollen is deposited on its back right here. And then it goes from flower to flower. It seeds itself pretty well, so you know it, it can spread a little bit aggressively, but um, it's such a nice plant, and it's really really attractive to pollinators. Purple clone flower to me is the workhorse of your pollinator garden. Um, it is just such a hardy plant and it's going to geez, just be a bloomathon. It will bloom summer all the way through the fall. Um, and it's got such a vivid purple color to it. I think it mixes well with uh, other different plants and makes uh, you know nice textures and backgrounds. Um, you can leave the seed heads on for the birds after it's done blooming, especially goldfinches will really enjoy those seeds. If you don't like the look of the dead heads in the garden, you can always um, cut them and just lay them down in the garden and, and you end up with new uh, cone flowers in your garden as well. And it is a deer resistant plant. 
Um, a little word on cultivars. Um, so, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of cultivars. They're often chosen for their qualities, and it could be color, but it could also be, you know, for disease resistance or uh, the size, you know, a dwarf varieties and things like that. And um, so, what I would caution you to, to look out for is um, when the functionality of the plant has been changed. So, this is um, a coneflower um, that I, I thought was quite nice last year. I think it's called White Swan. Um, and it was very, very attractive uh, to bees, especially um, bumblebees and carpenters really seem to enjoy it. Um, but this variety over here is called Rasmataz. Um, so this is, you know, um, double petaled in here. And you can see that there's, there's no source of pollen or nectar in this plant. And in fact, it's, it's honestly a not a great cultivar in my opinion, because it's um, the flowers are so heavy that it ends up tipping over anyway. So just be careful when you're looking at cultivars to make sure that they're still serving that function in, um, in the environment. Black-eyed Susans are another great plant for your pollinator garden and they're really quite easy to grow. Um, so they do like full sun, they don't mind it hot, gonna bloom all the way summer through fall. They are a short-lived perennial, so they may or may not come back that second year, but the good news about black-eyed Susans is that they easily reseed themselves. So if you have black-eyed Susans, they should reseed. And the best part is that if they, you know, if you plant those seeds in the early spring, they will bloom that summer. So you don't have to wait for that plant to kind of build up. It'll actually bloom that summer. And I love these for cut, you know, cut flowers. I love bringing cut flowers in the house. So these and cone flowers. Uh, I love to cut these. I do leave a lot for the bees though. Passion flower vine is, y'all can laugh. It's one of my favorite flowers. Beautiful, um, such a neat, unusual flower. I, I always think this looks like aliens designed a flower. It's just such a strange looking, but beautifully vivid purple flower. Um, they call some people call them May pops. Um, there's probably two reasons for that. One, it does have a, um, a, a fruit on it. So it's a sort of green, um, looks like a small racquetball. And if you step on it, will make a pop noise. But also they call them May pops because passion flower vines uh, spread by runner. So they, they may pop up here, they may pop up there. Uh, you'll see these growing over your hedgerows. So if you have, even if you have azaleas, they do love to pop up through there and then climb over the top, but they're really somewhat of an inoffensive uh, vine. So they're not gonna choke out or kill your plant. They're, they're, they're pretty um, spindly vines. So um, they're, they're a great plant, um, drought tolerant. You'll see them on stream banks and roadsides. To me, the most important function of this plant is that it's a host plant for Gulf fritillary butterflies. So you see this, uh, this butterfly is a pretty common butterfly in our area. Um, and this is the only host plant for it is um, passion flower vines. Um, so you see these lovely little caterpillars, spiky little caterpillars. Um, this is what the um, chrysalis of the Gulf fritillary butterfly looks like. And I think this looks exactly like a dead leaf. Um, so this is a good reminder for us to, um, you know, not be so ruthless in our cleanup at the end of the season. Another way that we can support pollinators is by leaving the leaves at the end of the season rake those into your garden beds and get free organic material, um, but you'll also be um, taking care of those overwintering pollinators um, in those leaves as well. Coral honeysuckle is a great uh, vine uh, that, that's great to train on a trellis. Um, it is a non-invasive vine, so not like its counterpart, the Japanese honeysuckle that we see a lot of in the environment. Um, this has beautiful red blooms on it. Um, and you can see that these are, you know, just built for, for hummingbirds. They, they want to stick their long bill in there, get their face full of pollen and move on to the next, uh, next uh, flower. So it's, it's going to be really attractive to hummingbirds. And these will start blooming pretty soon. These are pretty early uh, spring bloomer, but a nice, a nice plant to train up on a trellis. Um, butterfly weed is, is an example of one of these very um, host, you know, host specific plants. So these are why these native plants are so essential because so many of our native insects have these um, specific interdependent relationships with our native plants. Um, so butterfly weed um, and Asclepius, the milkweed species are very specific for monarchs. Without milkweed, we can have no more monarchs. 
Um, so, you know, if you've got the space, plant some butterfly weed. This is my favorite of the milkweeds. I think it's quite hardy for our area. Um, it has lovely orange flowers on it that are attractive to a wide variety of pollinators. It's um, moderately salt tolerant. So if you live in a coastal area, it can take a little bit of salt spray. It's drought tolerant. It can grow in sandy, poor soils. It does take two to three years to establish by seed. So if you do plant by seed, um, just be patient. Um, and the, one of the downsides of, of this is that it doesn't transplant well. So once you've planted in an area, it's, it's not easy to move. Um, so you know, decide where you want it. Um, we have this planted in masses uh, in, in the Arboretum um, stormwater infiltration zone. We found that to be quite attractive to monarchs. Um, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna plant milkweed, if you're gonna plant any pollinator plants in general, um, it's good to plant in at least threes. So instead of having one plant here and one plant here, you can make it easier for those insects to find those plants. Um, so it's a good rule of thumb in landscaping to at least uh, have three of a plant together. It makes it a little more striking, um, a, a little more visually pleasing in your landscape. So here's the big, beautiful monarch caterpillars. Um, and then uh, once they're done, you think you're gonna you think you're gonna run out of uh, milkweed every time, um, and, and then eventually they finally uh, walk off and go find a high place to go uh, create their chrysalis. But I love to see monarchs in my garden. This is the black swallowtail butterfly, um, and if any of you have grown parsley in your garden, you may have been visited by uh, black swallowtail butterfly caterpillars. Um, it's always heartbreaking at the um, Extension Master Gardener Plant Clinic when people come in and they say, something was eating my parsley and so I squashed them all. So uh, a lot of folks don't know that these are going to turn into beautiful butterflies. Um, so these butterflies depend upon plants in the APACA family. Those are, that's the carrot family. So um, that is things like parsley and uh, this bronze fennel is another plant that they really like. But if you'd like to try a native um, uh, host plant for them, this is Golden Alexander. So this is Zizia. I've actually just planted this in my garden last year. So I'm really excited to see it bloom and see how attractive it is this year. Um, does like a little bit wetter soil and partial sun, but you can see it's a, you know, got a great yellow bloom on it. Very attractive to bees and butterflies. And it is that host plant for the um, black swallowtail butterfly. Another plant that you would never expect to be related to any of those plants is the rattlesnake master. This is a fascinating plant and um, we've got this planted in masses at the, the arboretum and um, it looks more to me a little more like a yucca plant. Uh, it's got these strappy uh, shaped leaves but when you crush the leaves they actually smell like carrots so they are actually in this APACA family. So this is um, this could be a host plant, uh, but I, I haven't ever seen the black swallowtail butterfly use it, but technically it is in that um, same carrot family. Um, this is a tough plant. It is extremely drought tolerant. It does have a long tap root that goes down, um, which makes it be able to handle that drought. Um, and it's it was very attractive to pollinators, um, especially we saw a lot of skippers and um, bumblebees out there. Um, you can see it here. Uh, it's got this great uh, stalk of flowers that it sends up. I think these look almost like little disco balls, but it's a neat texture uh, for the garden and it looks really, really neat planted in masses. We have this, um, our, our stormwater area is planted out in a meadow style. Um, so if you have a natural area or maybe you want to kind of get rid of parts of your lawn, something like this might be an, uh, an idea for you. We have it planted out with different grasses like muley grass and little blue stem grass. Um, plants, you know, we have um, the spotted bee balm in there, we've got milkweed, we've got the, you know, all kinds of different uh, things in there, and it makes this lovely texture and layers in there, um, and it is just, just a, such a nice amenity for um, pollinators in that area. Last one I'll mention today is um, Blazing Star, so this is Leatris. There are a couple different kinds of, um, or a couple different species of Leatris. Um, mm -hmm. This is uh, just a lovely plant, lovely purple color, um, three to five feet tall, has these nice stalks of purple flowers, likes the full sun, doesn't mind heat and humidity. Neat thing is it, it blooms from the top down, so you can see it, it, it creates blooms all the way down, so it'll bloom here and then, and then move the way down. 
I found this very attractive to um, monarch butterflies. Um, again, it does look uh, best planted in masses or at least uh, threes, it looks quite good. Um, very attractive bees and butterflies and the seeds are eaten by uh, gold finches so you can leave the seed heads on once the flowers are spent. A lot of people will say to me, um, you know, Amy, I want to support pollinators but I don't have a yard. I just have a patio or I have a little tiny, tiny yard. Don't be afraid to, um, you know, do pollinator gardening in containers. Um, I wouldn't spend too much money on putting a whole bunch of perennials in a container, but you could maybe have um, something like coneflower or black-eyed Susan as a centerpiece and then use annuals. You could put mountain mint in a container, would be perfectly happy to take up that whole container by itself. Um, annuals are great for, um, for pollinators as well. Um, uh, salvias are, are, are much beloved by pollinators or verbena. Um, I love zinnias because I love cut flowers in the house and they are they are absolutely pollinator magnet. Lantana could be good in a, in a container as well. Um, this is a, one of my favorite annuals. It's Calibracoa, um, which is I think called Million Bells and it comes in a couple different colors and it, um, it spills over your containers and I found this to be attractive to um, bumblebees especially love to crawl inside the, the neck of those flowers. So. Um, don't be afraid to create some beautiful um, pollinator gardens in containers for, for your pollinator friends. One thing I'll turn you on to before I uh, finish is um, NCC Grant is a sister organization to Cooperative Extension. Um, and they have, you probably have heard about this, they've created this Coastal Landscapes Initiative. Um, it's a wonderful um, uh, product uh, for our coastal area. Um, and they go over all of the different native plants that are going to do well. They specifically choose plants that are going to be commercially available or more easily commercially available. So that's a good thing. Sometimes when you hear about obscure native plants, they're hard to find. Um, but one of the neat products that they've just put out is these landscape designs, which I think are really helpful. Because sometimes I know what plants to plant, but I don't know how they would look together. Um, so here's an example of a pollinator friendly border. Um, so you can see that they have um, show you the different plants you, you can plant in this landscape. Here's the sweet pepper bush, butterfly weed, wild blue indigo is an early spring blooming plant with uh, blue flowers on it, purple coneflower, and then pink muley grass. I'll show you the side view, how it would look, and then they'll give you the planting plan here as well. Uh, what's neat is they, they tell you, you know, what these plants are good for. Um, they'll give you alternatives. So if you have dry soil, maybe you're gonna plant yucca, um, if you want something that is um, evergreen, you can choose inkberry, give you perennial substitutes. Um, and then they'll show you when these things are gonna be blooming so that you're having something blooming all year long. And then they'll tell you how to maintain those plants. So this is a really nice product. So if you, you can just look this up by putting in Sea Grant Coastal Landscapes Initiative, and there are a lot of resources available there. Um, so with that, I'll end and I will um, take any questions you have and, uh, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Amy. We really appreciate that. Um, that was very, very helpful and informative and a great way to um, start off our Pollinator Palooza Week. <laughs> um, there was at least one question on Facebook. Of course, I clicked away. Um, oh, uh, Maria from Facebook was wondering if ants can be pollinators. I think they can be pollinators. I, I think there's probably specific ants that are, that, that's probably out of my realm of knowledge, but I know that there are specific plants that, or specific ants that do that. I'm not sure if any of our sort of ground nesting ants are the ones doing that here in our area, but I, I know I've seen things in the world where there are specific ants that are pollinators. Very cool. Um, there is a question also, um, Stacy was wondering about local nurseries that you recommend that carry native plants um, or do you have, and or do you have a resource list um, with the trees and shrubs and plants that you were, um, that you referred to that we can mm -hmm. check back in on later? So I would definitely um, check out that Coastal Landscapes Initiative, and a lot most of the things that I've talked about today are in that um, are, are in that resource there. Um, 
a couple of places that I would go locally for um, native plants. Um, Shelton Herb Farm is carrying more and more native plants. They're becoming a great resource for our area. Um, Wild Bird and Garden often has little pop-up sales. They have a, um, a, a business called Going Native. Um, that's one of our master gardeners. And so she does sell plants. For things like shrubs and, um, and trees, you know, Tinga can probably get you th some things or we'll have some things on stock. Tender pines um, and five oaks would be other resources. Um, but the, the, oh, that's me. Um, but the, the more that people ask for these plants, the more that they will get them. I think I was just reading something today about, you know, um, be patient because, you know, a lot of these shrubs and trees, it's taking longer uh, to, um, to build up this stock. Um, so, you know, keep asking for them, um, ask for alternatives and, uh, you know, keep, but keep looking out and keep asking for these natives. Oh, I will tell you, the Brunswick County Master Gardeners are about to have a native plant sale. And I just saw the plant list and I'm gonna spend too much money on it. Um, but so Brunswick County Extension Master Gardeners, and I will um, I'll look up for that resource, but um, they will be opening, it'll be an online sale and it'll be pickup. Um, uh, will be available here in, in Brunswick County. So um, I'll, see, I'll see if I can send out that resource to y'all. Very cool. I've looked for Inkberry and I cannot find anyone that knows what I'm even talking about um, at, at nurseries. So I'm just gonna keep asking. <laughs> keep asking, keep asking. <laughs> Very good. Um, are there other questions from the audience? You may certainly just unmute and ask it if you would like. Transplanted garden has had ink berries, but they've died every time I've planted them. I don't know. I can't keep them alive. Oh, no. All right. Frustrating. <laughs> and you know what you're doing. So I, I yes. think I, I should probably We're in trouble. <laughs> not try to do that. <laughs> cool. Stacy, do you have a question? I was going to say, I've seen um, some of the trees, actually, that you mentioned, the, especially the Sweet Bay Magnolia at Transplanted Garden. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very curious to try and find some of those. We had some dogwoods that we did that, unfortunately, we planted three. Two of them have died. Aww. So um, we're really looking to maybe replace those with things like we were thinking river birch, but I would love it for it to be something too that might be pollinator friendly. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I, I'm a big, I'm excited about a Sweet Bay Magnolia. I think I'm gonna get one for my yard. I was just over at UNCW campus and I will say UNCW has made a lot of strides. And if you drive through there, they have been really pushing planting natives over there and they have new areas that are planted out with longleaf pines and Sweet Bay Magnolias. And it is lovely. It's really gorgeous. Um, a river birch is a great tree too. It's, it's you know pretty wind hardy as well. So that's and it has that lovely yellow color in the fall. These bright golden uh, and then that really interesting bark as well. So both good trees. Um, but you know then you get the flower on the sweet bay magnolia. Which that is always like a flower. Yeah. I'm always looking. <laughs> I know. I know. Stephanie? Yeah. In the Northeast area, the uh, North Carolina Aquarium on Roanoke Island has a great pollinator garden and uh, all the plants are well marked. So it's a great place to visit. Very good. That's awesome. Um, I'll make a note of that. That'll be really cool to, for us to share out during our pollinator palooza next week on social. So thank you for the, the tip, Skip. Appreciate that. Um, cool. Are there any other questions before we head to our wrap up announcements? Okay. Well, I'll say thank you guys all so much and I hope you enjoy the spring weather and don't sneeze too much with pollen, but uh, it, it's worth it to have the warm weather. Absolutely. Thanks again, Amy, for being here. And um, uh, just, just another remember, like reminder, if you can't get enough of Amy Mead, um, join us next Saturday on the 17th for our live stream that will cap off our, um, our Pollinator Palooza. We'll have um, City of Wilmington, Parks and Rec, um, Cooperative Extension, Air League Gardens, educators from all of these awesome partners that will join us on the live stream and show off their pollinator gardens and teach us 
a um, little more in depth about some different pollinators that are um, native to North Carolina. So definitely be there for that. Um, pop into our Facebook page this week to find um, other uh, new, like brand newly made just for this event um, videos all about pollinators. And then join us next Friday for little lunch lecture. Jill Pelusius from Wild Bird and Garden, Amy just mentioned, um, will be with us and um, talking about nesting birds, um, which can be pollinators too. So we're throwing them into pollinator week. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate everyone being here today. Join us for pollinator palooza and we'll see you soon. Yay. Happy weekend. Yay. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> Bye.